Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Sam's Healing Podcast. Obviously, my name is Sam. I am thrilled that you are tuning in today. Whether you are watching or listening, I'm just glad that you're here. Today, I have a great friend of mine and a survivor of infidelity. Now, there's many of you who are betrayed males who are trying to heal. I'm always empathetic. I've talked to so many betrayed males over the last almost two decades who feel alone, who feel like an albatross, who feel like, you know, every time I listen to an interview or every time I watch a podcast, I always have to hear she, as in she is the betrayed. But what about us betrayed males? So today, a great friend of mine by the name of Jordan has come in. We have not put him on camera just to protect his identity and to keep his business life out of this, but he's offered to come in and share some of his story. So Jordan, I can't thank you enough for coming in. How are you doing? I'm great, Sam. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm the one that's thankful. And I think betrayed males all over the universe are going to be thankful to hear a little bit of your story. So let's jump right in. Why don't you give everybody a few bullet points of what has happened and where you're at now? Sure. So I'm 34 years old. I've got two kids. I've uh, been married since 2015. I've been with my wife uh, since high school. So we we are the uh, high school sweetheart story. Um, D-Day for us was May 1st of 23. So a little closing in about 10 months. Uh, I found out my wife had an emotional affair, which did turn physical when it came out, you know, my entire life did blow up. Um, I did not handle it very well. I said some very mean things. Um, you know, I, I physically was sick. I blamed myself a lot. I felt, you know, violated. Um, but one of the difficult parts for me were finding any kind of help or resources for betrayed men. It was, everything was really for females. So that's kind of where I started the journey. So I want to speak to this because I think there's the ability, there's an, an acronym that I teach in couples work where it's A-V-R, where you acknowledge, you validate, and you reassure. It works in, in couples work, but it also works in a situation like this. So for the betrayed males out there who, I would describe it as a gut punch every time they have to hear that she, as in the betrayed and not taking into account the betrayed male. What was it like for you? Because it had to be alienating. It had to be pretty dark. And we've talked a little bit off camera about it, but maybe help the other betrayed males feel not so alone by your story. Yeah, it. Um, you, you're right. It did feel alienating. Uh, I think, you know, we read and hear a lot about the nuances but it's just, you know, what are the nuances? I think one of the big ones for, for guys and that I can relate heavily to is that territorial feeling, you know, like it, this is your wife and, um, or your girlfriend. And then this, and you know, someone came and kind of took that from you. So it, it does leave you feeling pretty awful. You know, it, it makes you feel like the world's biggest loser. Uh, how could this happen to me? How could it happen to, you know, to a guy like me, you know, the dad and, um, the, the good dad who can, goes to work, provides for the family. You know, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. My marriage wasn't the greatest, but I didn't think this really, you know, deserved to happen to me. So. And in dealing with it, what prompted you to actually reach out and get help? What was kind of the moment that prompted you to say, look, I, I can't keep living like this in this dark hole, what actually moved you to take action, face the embarrassment, face the shame and actually get help? I did come to a point where, you know, I was initially very prideful. I didn't want to go to therapy. And this was even before D-Day occurred. Um, the, the, the marriage was kind of in its own crisis. And I said, you know, I, I don't need a therapist. I can figure it out. I'm smart enough, very prideful. And, um, it got to the point where everything did come out. Everything did blow up in my face. And I said, well, it's very clear. I don't know how to handle my own situation. And, um, I clearly need, um, uh, need some help and need a Nick, need someone with that, 
unbiased expert view who's been through this. And, you know, I just had to kind of swallow that, that pride and say, okay, I'm not the smartest man in the room. And I think every betrayed partner at some level comes to that point, but there's something about being a betrayed male that it feels like I should be able to kind of DIY my way through this and I should just suck it up, right? That's the plight of men. Suck it up. Don't talk about your feelings. Don't get emotional. Don't get vulnerable. What are you talking about? Just be a man and compartmentalize that stuff, put it in a tub, throw it in the garage of trauma and pain and move on, right? Exactly. So, and before we talk about what did help, I want to do a little different because do it a little different because I want the other betrayed males to be like, okay, that resonates. So what did not help you? As you launch out, as you're trying to heal, as you began to experience some things that only frustrated you and only made you feel even maybe more pain, talk about the things that did not help you first. Sure. So I've been an avid note taker since everything has come to light. So I have I'm I'm glad I kind of documented this journey because I can kind of go back and see and feel exactly where I was. So what did not help? Number one was blaming myself. Um, somebody else chose to, you know, bring this into my life. It, it was not my fault. Uh, I, I wrestled with that one probably for a good month or two, really until I probably also got the right help. But um, there was a lot of blame. You know, I wasn't a good husband. I didn't do this right. I didn't pay her enough attention to her. I didn't, you know, there, there's a million excuses. And I, it finally dawned on me. I was like, you know what? The problem's not with me. It's it's with her. She chose to do that. So that was number one is blaming myself did not help. Number two was being mad at the affair partner. Um, at the end of the day, it was really my wife's choice to relinquish what we had, you know, just to go get some cheap affection. And, um, you know, because everyone would normally say, you know, hey, aren't you mad at that person? I'd go, no, because if my wife wouldn't have offered it up, never would have happened. So any, there's, you know, probably a line of 100 people lined up willing to capitalize on something like that. So, well, and sometimes based upon where we're at emotionally, wouldn't you agree just from an experiential perspective that sometimes we can find it easier to get mad at the affair partner than we can to get mad or angry at our spouse? Oh, totally. You definitely want to direct that anger towards them because you think they're the one that brings all the pain into your life. But yeah, with the experience and what I've kind of been able to kind of look back and kind of look at us from that above view and look down and go, you know, it was really not that other person's, um, it's not their fault. It was really my wife to, you know, decide, yeah. like I said, to give that up. And every situation is a little different. We understand that there are some guys that might be out there saying, you know, this was a friend. This was something that a situation where this affair partner was a friend or knew about the vulnerability of our marriage. And I want to speak to that for those of you that are watching or listening and say, we call that a double betrayal. You're betrayed by your partner, but then you're betrayed by a close friend or someone that felt like a brother. And that's absolutely... True, there is a term. It's called a double betrayal, and it hurts like hell. But for you, you also said there was a, something about measuring progress that really did not help you, and I thought it was so important that you would talk about that because I think so many couples, whether it's a betrayed male or a betrayed female, struggle with this measuring progress that you kind of fell prey to. So talk about that. Yeah, so, you know, there's... This recovery has been a long journey and it's not been a perfect recovery. And there's just been a lot of difficult days, um, you know, six months into it where I thought I'd made a turn. And then all of a sudden I got slammed by all these feelings of anger all over again, like moved right into the grieving process. And some of those days just really make you think that you're like, man, am I really healing? Am I moving the right direction? But I was measuring it day by day. I was going to say, you know, what was I, what was it yesterday? What is it today? What is it tomorrow? And I just started failing day after day going, man, these are just, how am I having this many bad days in a row? What's happening? And then I started to say, well, I can't really measure it that way. I've got to look at where was I three months ago? Where was I six months ago? And boy, like we have grown as a, as a couple, we have, the communication has been like, n never have, <laughs> gee, I fumbled that word up there. 
so so the communication has never been as we've never been as connected as as we have been today and i think a lot of that has contributed to getting the right help um and learning how to uh, identify those emotions because that's another thing i would tap on is say you know like you said a lot of guys we know you know anger and we know happiness and that's kind of what we know (laughs) that's our limit um but you know going through this i go wow you know a real man actually can name those feelings and he can actually be vulnerable and share those feelings um so learning how to do that has been a big piece of it so yeah measuring the progress over uh maybe a month or two and just say hey where were we at two months ago where were we at four months ago and kind of look and see how things look from there yeah rick reynolds had a fair recovery great friend of mine used to work for him he talks about micromanaging recovery where every day oh today was a good day maybe we're gonna be okay ah today was a trash day we're done for right and being able to set a date usually at least three to maybe six months sometimes 12 months ahead and being able to go hey I'm not going to micromanage this. I'm going to look down the road and set a date. And when I get to that date, we will have trended really well, or we will have trended in a very dark, the trajectory has been very dark and maybe the relationship is in trouble. But would you agree that when you live on just a day-to-day reevaluation, that it's very hard to get your feet underneath you and find hope? 100% agree. Yeah, definitely. Very, very, it makes it very hard, difficult to look forward and um, say, yeah, we can get over this. That's good. So talk about what did help. Maybe keep in mind the guys out there that have tried some, some work and it's failed, or maybe they've gotten help from someone who wasn't an expert. There's something about guys. We are very prone to go, man, we tried that person and it was awful. I'll never do it again. I'm not doing that again. I was vulnerable. And that therapist or counselor or what have you, betrayed me and made me feel, and really for the betrayed male, there's an extra sensitivity, but there's also a sensitivity to a betrayed female when an authority figure, pastor, priest, rabbi, therapist, counselor, what have you, makes them feel like they're the reason their partner cheated. It can be very hard to go back and expose yourself again to someone like that. Am I right? That's right. So what did help you? What did help you make a few turns? And obviously, let the listener or the viewer understand, you're 10 months in. You're not an expert. You're not 10 years down the road. But this is real time for you, which is why I wanted you to come in. You're real time uh, healing right now. You're going through the 10-month stage So the other guys that are maybe a few months in or maybe a year or so in, they can hear your story and be like, yeah, I get it. Or man, that helps me. I thought I was the only one, right? That's right. So I started, um, I started with really just educating myself. Um, you know, what was I feeling? What just happened to me? Um, I was, you know, you, you're blindsided by all this. Um, right. So educating myself was really the number one thing. And that meant reading books, finding videos, um, just really trying to understand why is my body doing this? Why don't I want to eat? Why, you know, why am I angry out of nowhere? Like, you know, you'll have a good moment and just you blow up the next second. So figuring out what was really happening was, was one of the big things. And once I understood, oh, I'm, 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 I'm dealing with betrayal trauma here. It, it kind of normalized it for me. It, it validated everything I was feeling because I felt really alone. I felt kind of crazy that I was just, I should be able to go to work and um, interact normally and come home and be with my, you know, present with my kids. And I just couldn't do any of that. It was really difficult. Um, so once I was able to put a label to everything that was happening, that really helped me move, move along. What was, you know, for us as men, we kind of think, man, I've, I've got to have an experience like a Vietnam or I've, or like an active shooter or some type of situation to call something trauma. It, what made you finally realize, you know what, this is a traumatic experience and I'm going to allow myself as a big burly man. We don't have you on camera to protect your identity, but you are a man's man. You're not soft. You're not effeminate. You are a strong, capable, very educated, very talented male in your profession. But 
what puts you to the point where you could finally give yourself compassion and put that label of, hey, this is a traumatic experience? You know, having all of those feelings validated, um, that was done through therapy, that was done through group work. Um, a lot of the videos uh, that really soothed me, um, it was just like, hey, if, if, if you're feeling this, 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 that's betrayal trauma, man. And I was like, wow, okay, I'm, that is real. That is what I'm feeling. Um, so it's just nice to be able to find a community, you know, like a, just of people who, who get it. And that's what drove me into therapy. And, you know, I, I started with a general therapist. Um, and I had to seek another perspective because about three or four months into it, I said, you know, we're, I'm just not feeling better. I'm not, right. you know, we're, we're not jiving We're something's not here. Um, yeah. So that's when I said, okay, what, what, what am I missing here? Why, why am I not hitting it? And, um, I, I was not with a certified trauma specialist. Yeah. So it's not that the first therapist didn't want to help me. They just didn't know how to help someone who had been through betrayal. Right. And that's a great point. You also went and did some EMDR, which is a form of therapy that is specifically for trauma, which I fully believe in as long as you're dealing with someone who's an expert, who understands betrayal trauma, who's not just kind of cutting their teeth on you and you're not there, you know, very early on in client. But Talk about how EMDR helped you and what it did for you. Yeah, the, probably one of the turning points of recovery was EMDR. That was um, everything I'd read basically said, you know, if you go through some EMDR, you'll um, you'll be able to have a lot of those charged feelings diffused. You, you know, you want to make this a memory. And I said, man, I don't, I don't, that sounds crazy to me. I don't know if that'll okay. work. And um right. Because when you read it on paper, uh, you know, about what it would look like in a therapy session, you, you go, I don't know if that really worked, but I was getting desperate at that point. I said, I'm not getting any better. I'm, I w I'm willing to try it. And, you know, I trust a lot of the experts. Um, so, yeah, I went through that. I, I did a few sessions and um, I would say it definitely worked pretty quickly. Um, about, we'll say three sessions, so about three hours of it. And um, it it got to the point where I was finally able to think about the affair in general and just not get angry. It, it just, it was able to move it into a memory, uh, which felt right. really nice not to be so charged up about it. That's great. And you also did a course called the EMS online course at Affair Recovery, right? I did. We did. Um, what was your experience doing that? Really good. Um, I told my wife that I wanted to do it. She was hesitant because, you know, she was very sh ashamed of what she did and she didn't want to talk about, you know, air out her dirty laundry in front of others, but it was definitely in a really private setting. It was just over the phone. We had a workbook that we worked out of every week and there was just exercises that were very specifically tuned for two people who were trying to figure out if they can make it or not. And they yeah. emphasize that. They emphasize that. They say, hey, you know, you may not have your mind made up if this is going to work or not, but you're giving it a shot. And I'll say that group work, my goodness, that has it, it to bring a feeling of normalcy to me um, is an understatement for, for what that course did, because I was talking to other betrayed dudes just on the phone um, and you just didn't feel so alone anymore because so it good. really, yeah, it really does really good work. Man, and that's so good. That's why we're doing this because I want these betrayed males and I also want betrayed females who are listening to realize this is an epidemic. But if you can not feel so alone, if you can not feel so much like an albatross, like you're just out on an island trying to survive, then man, we've, we've done our good deed for today and we have done what really needs to be done. But you mentioned something about your wife. Talk about your wife's demeanor. Was she remorseful? Was she open? Was she willing? Where was she with this whole thing? It was hard for her. Um, you know, the first 45 days, she was really emotionless. Um, I, I had no idea if this was someone that even wanted to reconcile with me. Um, 
so she, for herself, she got her own therapist, which was good. She kept up with that. She did the group work with me, the EMSO work. Um, and it was just really almost in a way beautiful to watch her grow into a position of caring for me because every time we talk about it, she shuts down. She was a classic go hide in her shell kind of thing. And, um, once we've gone through weeks and months and just especially working at those, um, those couples exercises, she really did start to, to grow and I could feel it. And, um, it started, it started feeling really good, especially when she started moving, um, and learning about being empathetic. And it's something we're still working on today. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a very yeah. hard thing to pick up. I think they have to be really coached into it, but once absolutely, um, there was, there was yeah. one moment, sorry, there was one moment that, that we turned the corner and um, there's been several of those moments rather, but there was one moment in particular where there was one day I was just having a really bad day. And I said, I'm just really angry. I'm really upset with you. And it was the first time that she had not gotten defensive and shut down. She just pretty much sat there and said, you know, you're right that I did mm-hmm. do that. I'm sorry. And I'll, you know, I'll do whatever it takes to get the help that I need to get better for us and for you. And like, I just, so when, I, when that hit my ear, I was like, oh my gosh, she's starting to get it. She's starting to move into a position of being concerned with my, my hurt. And that, that felt really good. That's awesome. As we kind of wind down here, I think what might be helpful for the betrayeds, male or female, but also for the males who are really trying to get their footing, what was your biggest battle? What was like the biggest struggle that if you had to name one, and I know that there's, it's multi-layered betrayal trauma, male or female, but for you, the biggest battle that you had, what do you think it was if you had to name it? It would be letting this just consume my life. Every day I would wake up thinking about how I'm betrayed. Every time I would hear something, talk to someone, it would remind me of the betrayal. I just could not have a normal day where I just didn't have to think about it. Um, so I was, I was drowning in it and that was, that was the biggest battle. And I, I, you know, like I said, I contribute a lot of those successes, a lot of those uh, helpful items to, to get me out of that. But that was that was my biggest battle was just being swallowed up in it. That's great. You know, as we say goodbye, if you were to switch roles, let's say that you are someone that's out there watching or listening. You've said some some fantastic stuff from just a survivor. And if you were to be out there listening, think about what you needed to hear. Think about before you had momentum, when you were in your darkest days, when you were in such a dark spot, people talk about not wanting to get out of bed, not wanting to eat, not wanting to function, not just abandoning themselves because the hurt is so much, it's so incapacitating. Maybe as we say goodbye, take a minute and talk to the betrayed males out there or even the betrayed females who, man, they're just lost. They're just, everything is dark. Everything is hard. I mean, everything is hard. Take a minute and encourage them and maybe give them what has really helped you. Give them what you needed to hear 15 months ago or 10 months ago that you struggled to hear. Maybe you are a messenger today of hope and faith and encouragement to those that are in one of the darkest days they've ever known. Yeah, so what I would say is, you know, Betrayal trauma is very real. Um, your hurt is very real. You do not fight it alone. Um, find someone to talk to. If you cannot find a close friend or family member, find a therapist, find specific help for you. You need to find someone who's trauma specialized. Uh, finding community was absolutely big. You know, they're out there. You can do EMSO work. There's, you know, forums of betrayed spouses just being able to talk to someone who gets you makes you feel not so isolated anymore. I think it's great. And for those of you that are watching who are a betrayed male, I just want to appeal to you and tell you, I get it. I understand the pain. I understand the struggle that you are trying to move forward in. 
I'm just glad that you're here today. If I can help, you can reach out to me at Sam's Healing Podcast at gmail.com. You can leave a comment here. And if I can point you in the right direction, if I can help you find help, if it's not through me, maybe it's through someone else, or maybe there's some nuances to your story where you might need a certain type of help. But don't try and do this alone. Don't be another victim of isolation where you start to make even worse choices, where you self-abandon and self-neglect because you just can't find your footing. I promise you, like Jordan and so many other men, you can find your footing. You can actually find healing. I don't know about your relationship, but I know that you can heal and maybe I can help. Jordan, I can't thank you enough for coming in and telling your story and being willing to lay it all out there. So thank you for coming in, Jordan. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time.